Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is episode 15 of our Secular Bible Study series. We are focused on Ezra today, which is a neat, interesting little book. We'll get to it here in just a minute. But first, I want to say thank you to everyone who has been following along for 15 episodes now. There's thousands of you watching every single Thursday, and it's very encouraging and really cool to see. I hope that these will be a great resource for so many of us to better understand what this Bible really is. But on to today's video, let's go ahead and jump right in with point one, book overview. So a few things to note about Ezra that are important. It is originally connected to Nehemiah. So we, for the canon, have broken it out into two separate books. But really, this was one main book focused on three characters, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. The book is really told in two waves here. First of all, we have Cyrus the Great letting Zerubbabel lead back some of the people of Israel into their holy land. This is about 50 or 60 years after their captivity, with, again, the goal of rebuilding the temple. And then you get Artaxerxes about another 50 or 60 years later, letting another wave go. And this has Ezra as kind of the leader, scribe, and priest. And we see some parallels between these two waves of Israelites returning to their homeland. It's also really interesting the motivations in the secular and real world for Cyrus and Artaxerxes to let these people go back as opposed to God working on their hearts, like we see here in the biblical account. I mentioned before last episode, but if you haven't listened to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, King of Kings, where you can learn all about this time period and Cyrus the Great, I would really really encourage you to do so. Now, like any other book we've covered so far, there's some really interesting and messy parts, and we'll definitely cover a lot during part seven with problematic passages, as well as any contradictions. But the main things that are interesting here is you have with the first wave, the elders were there to see Solomon's building of the temple. They remember God's presence being there. They remember all the glory. And so as they're rebuilding the temple, the young ones from the next generation who are attempting to do so, the elders just cry. They're so sad. It's not like it used to be. It's not like the good old days when God was still with us. There's a mysterious absence here. But why? We've done everything we were supposed to do. We've made it back to our homeland. The land got a Sabbath, which is God's reasoning for allowing the exile in addition to the punishment. We have the goal here of rebuilding the temple, fulfilling all divine David's first goal for God, which was giving him a house and Solomon's follow through on that. We're making all the right sacrifices. What's going on. And there's some infighting here. There's the elders telling the young kids, you don't get it. You don't get to be here. It's very, very strange. And all along, we have Zerubbabel just chastising these young people saying, no, you don't deserve to be here. You don't get to help. You don't know what it's like. And it's really just this very strange, unnecessary inner conflict among the Israelites, especially when trying to achieve the end goal of reuniting as a people group. And that's kind of where Zerubbabel's story ends. And then we get into Ezra. Again, we're going to fast forward 50 or 60 years. And the way that I've always pictured Ezra, and I don't want to give you a misconception here, but is kind of the cranky old, super knowledgeable, like no one knows the Torah better than Ezra. This guy's old school. This guy's all about the law. He's all about understanding that the reason for all these woes, all the separation, all the conflict, all the time in exile was because these people were just bad at following God's commands. And you know what? He would be right to think so. It's around this time in the Bible where I see Christians start to get away from the Pentateuch and they're like, oh yeah, those were, you know, laws for when they were in the wilderness. That stuff's over. Like we have priests now, we have prophets. We're making prophetic messages about the Messianic King. It's starting to look like more about New Testament and Jesus wrong. We are in the midst of the same God, although he is much less corporeal and has really taken his presence away. But the law hasn't changed, right? Isn't this God immutable? Didn't he mean what he said? All the blessings and curses that come from following the law or not following the law, they should still be in place. And Ezra recognizes this. Ezra knows we have no messianic king. We have no new covenant. We have nothing of the sort. We have the law. He is a Torah expert. And he leads the second wave of people out of exile under the approval of Artaxerxes and in they go. And what's the first thing he sees? Well, wouldn't you know it, intermarriage just pisses off these people who know their Torah. We can remember back to, I think it was Leviticus or maybe Numbers when the priest kills the first couple who intermarries and God says, thank you, priest. If you had not done this, I was going to have to wipe everyone out. This offends me so much. Later though, we would go on to have this happen all the time without recourse. And sometimes it's a big deal. Sometimes it's not. But Ezra thinks it's a 
huge deal. These people that have been living back in their home city have had a generation or two to start marrying and populating. They're marrying people from outside of their region. And Ezra says, these are as bad as the Canaanites. How dare you? You're all going to get these marriages annulled. It's time for divorce, which is really interesting because now we're playing with two different concepts. We have these old laws around marriage from Moses in competition with other laws about marrying outsiders, etc., which is the lesser of two evils. Either way, you're going to be breaking something. And so Ezra is getting very heated about this. And this is really kind of how the book ends. So it's weird here because a lot of people don't like Ezra, right? If you hear him preached about, he's the person that followed the letter of the law without understanding the the spirit of the law. He's the person that made these ideas without consulting with God. This wasn't, as we've seen elsewhere, God saying, hey, telling the prophet or the high priest, etc., like enact this new divorce thing. This is just him knowing the book, knowing the law better than anyone else and saying, no, we are going to follow this. It's like our first little example of someone who takes the Bible too literally versus other people who like the idea of it, but don't want to follow it, right? I've talked a lot about this in my other videos about fundamentalism, as bad as it is, really is people adhering to the strictness of the Bible, taking it literally, believing it means what it means, and trying to act and live that out. The progressives say, that's fanatical, that's so stupid, you're missing out on your personal relationship with God, you're not understanding the metaphors, you don't understand the allegory, you don't understand the poetry, etc. And it's all an excuse to not have to really live by the word. Ezra says it's time to live by the word. And people didn't like it, just like people don't like it now. Which begs the question, why do we all like this God? It's his words. These are his laws. This is what it looks like. It looks ugly. It looks like tearing families apart. That's what he did here. There were families that were broken and torn apart because of fear of God, because a man who was reading the book accurately said it's time to live up to these values. But I'm already preaching. I'm already getting into point seven. So let's digress. Really, that's it. I considered once again combining Ezra and Nehemiah here because it is so short. It's just 10 chapters, I believe. But I really want this to have a nice 66 episode feel so that we're matching up with the canon exactly. By the way, we'll probably get into some of the other books and other canons when this is over. We'll probably get into some of the Gnostics or Apocrypha, etc. But we're definitely going to start with just the main 66. So point two is authorship and date. We can to date very easy. This is the 5th and 6th century BCE. We see this line up very simply with Cyrus and Artaxerxes. These are historical events that we can point to and we'll talk about that in point three. So the dating is very simple. The authorship, not so much. It is believed that again, these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, were originally one book, Ezra and Nehemiah, and that it was authored by Ezra. It makes a lot of sense, right? He was a scribe. He knew the law. He knew the history. And that's typically the Jewish tradition. The problem is, is that from the way that we have the fragments of these books and the different authorship styles, some of the different storytelling techniques, etc., it really looks like maybe there was an earlier part, the first few chapters, and then the parts with Ezra came in later. It looks like there's been some redaction and editorial things going on. We don't really have another good hypothesis, except it doesn't seem like there's one author of these two books. And we have good reason to believe that Chronicles, which is also associated with Ezra, was definitely not done by Ezra and was definitely done in the mid or post-exile period from an accumulation of sources. And there's all kinds of good scholarly reasons to believe that. So does that get applied to Ezra and Nehemiah? Maybe, maybe not. Is it possible Ezra wrote some of this, just recounting a few facts, and then that was kind of spun and told into story form and put together for these books? It is. We just really don't know. And this is going to be the coverage that I give for Nehemiah as well. So if you heard it here, you'll know it for the next book. We're going to move right on to point three where there's a little bit more to say with historical background and context and accuracy etc so the first part of this to understand is again just backing up the exile happens in 586 bce this is when babylon conquers jerusalem destroys the temple and brings these people into captivity then in 539 cyrus the great takes authority over this group of people and allows them by decree to go back to their homeland now they're still under foreign rule this is something that i think a lot of people don't understand they think oh like the war is over or something and these people are going back. No, they're under foreign rule. This would have been a really common practice at the time. And we still see this with Artaxerxes. He's the one kind of pointing Ezra, like keep your people in check, which is where we get a lot of these ideas about the reason these 
books were written and put together might have just been under foreign ruler rule in general to create order and stability in faraway places that they weren't controlling as strongly as when they were in captivity. It makes a great deal of sense. We know that religion has been used for control in many other parts of the world from many other rulers over the entire course of human history. Why not here with these people? Give them their myth, give them their rules, it will make them easier to subjugate, etc. There's a lot of debate. A lot of what happens here is kind of historical. We have an attempt of the rebuilding of the temple. We have the people in exile returning to Jerusalem. We see not only Jews going back to Jerusalem, but other people in captivity at this time under Cyrus being let go to their particular homelands as well. It's not just the Jews to Jerusalem. It wasn't just, we have these people, it's all we care about, now we're letting them go. Cyrus was kind of reorganizing the empire, if you will, and saying, okay, we've had these people in captivity, Activity, and for whatever reason, maybe it's a resource issue, maybe it's a manpower issue, etc. It's going to be better if we rule them in their homelands where they feel free to worship their God and live their way. In fact, we see this actually in archaeological evidence. This is one of the first corroborating archaeological things we have for any part of the Bible so far. It is called the Cyrus Cylinder, and it actually has parts of his decrees, again, where he's letting all these different people groups go back to their homeland. Another piece of archaeological history we have here is the Elephantine papyrus. This describes Jews at this time actually living in Egypt and gives us a little bit of insight into their lives, their culture, as well as some of the events within Ezra. As for the larger theological aspects of the divorce decree and the absence of God's presence from his temple, etc., these are just the theological implications of the book, and they have really no other extra biblical affirmations for it. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but doesn't mean it happened either. What we have here, the goal of this series, is to understand what we can know, what is more probable, and taking as much as we can on objective look at these texts. Moving on to point four, literary analysis. We have some interesting things. This is definitely within the genre of historical narrative account. It's a linear in nature. We start again with Cyrus and then Zerubbabel and then Artaxerxes and then Ezra. Wave one and wave two. There's parallels between this. We have the initial letting go by a foreign ruler of a group of people. Then we have a conflict, Zerubbabel with the people who are wanting to build the temple that are young and don't understand, and Ezra with the people who have intermarried. And then kind of this weird dropping off point that does pick up a little bit in Nehemiah, but really these are very strange concepts here. So there is that parallelism. Mainly it is the historical accounting. We do have some monologuing by Ezra, if you will. We have genealogies listed here that are pretty important of the Levites and the priests as well as those returning from exile in general. We have lists, list of people who helped build the temple, list of people who actually got divorces under the divorce decree. And we have documents, letters and decrees from Cyrus and Artaxerxes, etc. So really interesting in 10 quick chapters to cover so much and really start again moving us into the realm of history instead of just theology. So what main themes can we pull out of this? Point five main themes. The first one would be maybe the importance of temple worship or the rebuilding of the temple. Again, we don't get a lot of hard and fast information here about what God's intentions are. Is he just gone now and this is the beginning of divine hiddenness problem? Have they not done something right? Are they doing everything right, but things are different now after exile? There's a goal of restoration, an effort of rebuilding. But we haven't seen the conclusion of that yet. Imagine you're finally going back to your homeland. Some of these people were young and remember Solomon and the great temple. They've been in exile their whole life as they grew up and lived there. And now they've journeyed back. Is their goal to establish their family? Do we hear about how they're setting up farming? Do we hear about the markets and trade and how they're putting themselves back together as a society? No, we hear about immediately the efforts to rebuild the temple. It was the most important thing. They needed their connection to God. A second theme might be that of identity or community. We're back in our homeland. What are we going to be about? You know, again, Ezra is really coming in and in kind of a different tone than Zerubbabel with, we've got to get back to basics. We are people with a law from a law giver. It's time to follow the law. We need to figure out what our theme is going to be. Are we going to keep making the same mistakes? Are we going to keep intermarrying? Are we going to keep letting all these people from around us influence us with their fake gods and things of this nature? Or are we going to take a stand, clean up the house, and put some new forward measures together? This would be an important aspect or theme for any people group going back to their home after a long period of exile. Who are we? What's our purpose? What do we believe? How do we gather and we see that play out definitely here in Ezra. With only 10 chapters, I'm only going to give you two themes this time. 
In terms of point six, with reception and influence, we see a big influence on even modern Judaism. Portions of Ezra are read during the Jewish holiday, I'm going to mispronounce it, is it Samat Simkat Torah, which marks the beginning and the end of the Torah reading cycle. We see historical and theological references here in many of the rabbinic writings during the building of the Second Temple. The emphasis on the law comes into even certain modern sects of Judaism that hold more closely to Torah law. And we're able to look back and see during the Persian and Hellenistic periods the influence of Jewish tradition and the development of Judaism in general. As for continued relevance outside the Jewish communities from the Christian perspective, or at least the Protestant perspective, which I can speak on a little better here, it is just another one of those short old books in the Old Testament. Okay, the Israelites have gone back to their homeland. Cool. That's going to be good because eventually we need to set up where Jesus comes from. Again, almost everything at this point for the rest of the Old Testament is no longer about understanding God or his character or his morals. It's just what can we see here that might be prophecy that we can tie to Jesus and what plot points or developmental systems do we have in place to get to Jesus. And outside of the odd prophecy or command that is taken out of context, there's not much here for the modern Protestant to really work with. Sure, there are stories and themes about faith and doing what's right and listening for God and being faithful in the absence, etc. Like you can pull out whatever you want to pull out for a Sunday sermon. But how many of you who are Christians or were Christians spent a lot of time in your Bible studies looking at Ezra? Probably not very many of you. How many of you were reading Artaxerxes' decree of how and why the Jews should go back? Doesn't serve much purpose for what the modern Christian focus is. So let's end how we always end, contradictions first, and then we'll get into problematic passages. I think this time I'm going to give you some broad categories of things that happen here. We have historical details that are inaccurate. An example of this might be the number of exiles coming back or the order and timeline in which they happen differs from other books that go back and try to account for these same things. And you know what? I get the mistakes, right? We have all these different oral traditions and written lists and compiled histories, and they're put together at different time frames by different people under a different editorial process, and we get differences. This is what you would expect of a man-made system. And again, for some of you, that's a problem. For some of you, it's not. But this also leads to chronological details. Even with the exact rule of certain Persian kings, we have some inconsistencies both within the biblical books as well as up against some other parts of historical context. Even within Christian communities, there's not agreeance on some of the errors that we have. I know I said just contradictions, but we kind of get into the errors as well. This whole thing with Ezra and the divorce decree is seen differently by different Different groups of believers and theological historians, well, it was just for these people just at this time because we needed to start fresh. We were wounded. We were separated. We couldn't very well start intermarrying and have it all happen again. But it wasn't to be forever. That would be silly. God loves everyone, right? Like we started making some excuses here that really don't fit with the narrative. But there is enough open interpretation around Ezra and these decrees and his thought process and the fact it wasn't spoken from God, it was decreed by him, that lead us to figuring out, well, how should we view this? We definitely have naming contradictions in the genealogies and the lists that are provided in this book as well as in others, especially when compared with other characters and their lineages that we know from former books. Also, even though it's cool that we have the Cyrus Cylinder, it does conflict with some of the details found in Ezra 1, 1 through 4. Yes, we talk about exiles going home, but the way and the reasoning is different. Ezra 2 versus Ezra 8 gives us distinct different numbers of exiles returning home. There's some confusion around the difference between when we rebuilt the altar versus when we rebuilt the entire temple. That happens in Ezra 3. Ezra's arrival date is interesting. In Ezra 7:7, 7, 7, we hear that Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. However, this date seems inconsistent when comparing it to what Zerubbabel was doing with the temple at this time. Again, getting back to identifying the Persian kings accurately, the Bible states it is Artaxerxes, but there's good reasons to believe it was actually Artaxerxes II or even Artaxerxes III, which would put some of those other dating things in question, like when we say in the seventh year of this reign, well, which Artaxerxes are we talking about? Was it just a shorthand or did they really mean Artaxerxes I? There is some inconsistency in the book with the different timeline of the decrees. There is another character, Darius, that I didn't mention because he doesn't play as big a part, but you have not just one decree from some of these people. So you have decrees from Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, and they're mentioned at different times to do different things. Also, just again, this is what makes it look like it was written at different times or compiled in different ways, or Ezra wrote some of it, but not all of it. At the beginning, we have Zerubbabel as this key central figure. 
and he is just immediately dropped and dismissed, and Ezra seems to overtake things that were once attributed to him, and he's just missed at this point completely. Again, there could be some main, you know, issues and themes that they're trying to arise where they're just focusing on Ezra heavily and attributing certain parts of Temple Rebuilt to him to increase his presence as the Torah scholar and leader of the time, but again, it's just not consistent with its own text. So, that's enough of those. There's plenty more. Some of those might be debatable. I'm not saying that every contradiction I list is for sure an unanswerable, without context contradiction. But there's enough issues, enough of the time that we have to say, what's going on here? Why is it so hard if this is from the one true creator of the universe? But you've heard me say that spiel enough. Let's get straight into problematic passages. Okay. To be honest, 10 chapters, most of which are just historical countings and genealogies, there's not a whole lot of moral problems to focus on. So this is going to go by very quickly. I'm going to read you a few different verses here, and then we'll kind of talk about the concept at large. Ezra 9 verse will do 12. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. So we already know about the intermarriage thing, and that's already a very problematic thing, and we'll talk about that. But the thing that stuck out in this verse to me is not to make peace or have prosperity. This would be like an alliance. It's one thing when you want to keep a clean bloodline because you believe that that's what God wants, but we've seen the Israelite people have alliances, have friends in other territories that they can rely on or at least not invade or get invaded by. So this is a very strange decree. It seems to be a weird test by God saying, I'll take care of you if you want your kids to be in this land also and not, you know, it's a threat, not go back into exile, then rely on me and me alone. Scary. How about 10, 2 through 3? And Shekinah, the son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra. We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task and we are with you. Be strong and do it. So I guess, yeah, let's finally focus on the marriage issue here. It's really, really sick. Think about what this is like. I'm not sure exactly how long some of these people had been married, but the time frame between the first wave with Zerubbabel and Ezra at minimum would have been around 50 years. So let's say in the first five years, you have a young person who's 18 and they get married and they have three kids. And now it's decades later and they have a whole family. Or maybe someone got married in the 40th year and they've got two young toddlers, right? However you want to picture this to make it more visceral and real to you. These are real families. These are people who ideally love each other and support each other and are raising kids and are even raising them most likely to follow Yahweh. We don't see any other idol worship during this time. We see a real unification of Israelite people worshiping their God and trying to rebuild the temple and get back to basics. Imagine Ezra coming in and and saying what he's saying here, that there's still hope for Israel, but only if you do this thing, send the women and children away. So that leaves a few problems. One, you now have this bachelor, some of them being very old. The whole point is to reinstate the line here and start building Jerusalem again. So he's going to remarry, which makes him an adulterer, by the way. That seems problematic. God would rather have adulterers than good men that are taking care of their families. And these women and children that are being sent away, what do you think that looks like? Imagine all of these wives and all of their children cast outside the city walls, told you're on your own. We don't have any alliances. We don't have any peace treaties. We don't have any friends out there. I guess go back to the lands you came from. So they go back to these lands if they can even make the journey with these children with little to no resources and no help whatsoever totally open to all of the abuse that goes on in the ancient world. And if they do make it back to their homelands, many of the family they would have come from are now dead. All these women have children and are not virgins anymore. How do you think it's going to go for them with the men in their towns and their customs? They're worthless. I don't think it's exaggerating to say that this is a death sentence. 
or at least at the very best a life of misery ahead you know i just did that video on heaven and my point seven on heaven was that relying on heaven or god or the afterlife at all or trying to avoid hell all of it leads you to making bad decisions in the present we miss out on this life we make bad decisions in this life we reason incorrectly simply because of this belief system you want to see that play out it's right here men that are so afraid of their god that they would rather lose their wives and their children than risk god's wrath this is the beautiful love story of the bible so anyways i digress there's not much more to say on this book we'll get into nehemiah next thursday thank you for watching let me know what you think in the comments below and until next time keep thinking I wanted to personally thank my top tier Iconoclast patrons, Sean Skaggs and Jason Rollins, and my atheist advocate patron, Jared Nichols, for their incredible generosity. Also, a big shout out to my secular scholar patrons, of which we have some new ones. All other patrons are listed in the description of each video. Please consider joining this great group if you enjoy these videos or believe in my mission. Thanks, and have a great day.